Welcome to number seven in our Antenna Briefs series. Today we're going to talk about radio wave reflections. In previous videos in this series, we've talked about how signals get from a transmitter over to a receiver. And in episode two, we highlighted how the power received differs greatly depending on whether or not you have line of sight. So for example, here's a dish antenna pointed into space, and here's an orbiter around the planet Mars, and hundreds of millions of miles we can transmit. But for what we call terrestrial propagation, where you're going from, say, an FM broadcast antenna tower here down to somebody in a building, things can be drastically different. We may only be able to go a few miles, or even less than that. What we talked about in that previous episode is that in a terrestrial situation, this term in the denominator can actually be as high as d to the fourth or worse. And that drastically cuts your range, say from something like 20 miles down to 130 meters, which is like 400 feet. Why? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. We are also going to talk about how reflective antennas work. So we're going to talk about propagation, but also about antenna design. So why is the transmission range in a terrestrial application so much shorter than it can be with a free space line of sight situation? Well, the answer is fairly simple to state. Terrestrial environments have stuff in them, a lot of stuff. Now, when we're first learning things, it's important to keep the situation as simple as possible, and then we build on that. And that's what I hope for us to be able to do uh, with this video. So here we have a transmit antenna and the radio waves coming out of it. And like we talked about previously, uh, these are like wave fronts. So each one of these might be the peak E field. And the E field varies sinusoidally between them. So we have a peak here and a peak here and a peak here and a peak here. And of course, the distance between those is the wavelength. What I've added this time is something in the way. There is a box over here. And let's just assume for right now that it's metal. What happens when this radio wave goes by this box? Well, a lot. The portion of the wave front that strikes this front face here, which is tilted a little, will bounce off of that and be retransmitted down in this direction. Meanwhile, the top face is going to cause signals to bounce off in a different direction. So we get what we might call scattering. We also get something called shadowing, and that's represented by these wave fronts over here. Notice that immediately behind the box, there's no signal or very weak signal. But above it and below it, obviously, it was not interfered with by the box, the transmitted signal, and so it goes on. However, it will reconverge back through a process called diffraction. And so eventually you'll get some signal downstream of this. may not be super strong. It depends on several things. And the main thing it depends on is frequency, F, or wavelength. So I've given some examples here. For AM broadcast in the 1 megahertz range, the wavelength is about 300 meters. And that's about 1,000 feet if you're not used to meters. FM broadcast is somewhere around 100 megahertz, and so that's 100 times higher in frequency, which makes the wavelength 100 times shorter. And then we go up another factor of 10, 1 gigahertz, and this is where your cell phone radio operates, most likely. And there the wavelength is 0.3 meters, or about 12 inches. So the exact details of what happens here when the signal hits this box varies with frequency. And it will depend on how the wavelength compares to the dimensions of the box. But of course in the real world we don't have boxes, we have other kinds of objects. So I've got a picture here on the right which is from our campus and well you can see some boxes. Uh, the building has boxes. But there's also linear light poles here, there's a smokestack, uh, there are people, and there is ground. Don't forget ground. We're going to learn today that things bounce off the ground. And that can be a problem for propagation. So as we go through this material, keep in mind the scale of the wavelength in comparison to the objects involved. In general, we're going to be focusing on things at 100 megahertz and above, 
where the wavelength is 10 feet down to one foot. And that's small enough that many of the objects in the environment are going to be comparable in size to the wavelength, which is what we've shown for our little box. All right, let's move on. Here's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to start by looking at some applications. And we'll do that for propagation in a couple of different frequency regimes, one below 30 megahertz and one at VHF and above. But also we're going to look at antenna design applications. How does reflection theory factor into that? And we'll try to answer that with some real world antennas. Then, after setting the stage, we'll come back and look at the theory behind all of this. What we'll do after that is actually look at some real-world measurements, starting by looking at what Hertz did to demonstrate radio in the very beginning, and we're going to kind of repeat that experiment using a tiny spectrum analyzer and some dipole antennas. And the goal there is twofold. One is to prepare us for understanding how antennas are designed. For example, we need to know how far away to put an antenna from a reflector that might be behind it in order to make the signal go in the direction we want. And that kind of antenna design is central to things like cell towers. But once the signal leaves the cell tower and heads towards a user, we need to understand how much of that signal is going to reach the user and how it's going to get there. And you can see some reflection off a building here, reflection off ground, absorption in the trees, etc. So that's a lot to cover. And that's why what you're watching now is part one of episode seven. We're just going to cover the first bullet here. And then in part two of episode seven, we'll cover the theory and the demonstrations. Okay, let's get into it. Applications of reflections in propagation. If you are a ham radio operator, specifically with a general class or higher license, you may have used the so-called high frequencies, 3 to 30 megahertz. And ham radio operators that operate at HF can send signals basically anywhere in the world under the right conditions. Even though the Earth may block the signal, there is a mechanism called bouncing off the ionosphere or reflecting off the ionosphere that can allow a signal to leave an antenna in one state or country and bounce off and come back down in another state or country. And what's the ionosphere? It's a layer of charged particles in the upper atmosphere. And it varies throughout the day and depending on the sunspots on the sun and lots of other things. So this is not a terribly reliable propagation, but it is awful lot of fun. So how does this work? Well, in the simplest view, you can think of the ionosphere, remember it's charged particles, as a conductor. And as we'll see, radio signals will bounce off conductors. A detailed analysis in the case of the ionosphere shows that it's actually refraction. The signal comes into the ionosphere and it starts bending and then it bends back down. But you can think of that as a bounce or a reflection. And that can allow the signal to clear things like this mountaintop here and this mountaintop. As a little side note, well below 30 megahertz, in fact below 3 megahertz, you can get a lot of what's called ground wave propagation at low frequency and very low frequency. I won't go into that, but you could uh, search for that and learn more about it. The topic of this video is, of course, reflection and the associated things like absorption, diffraction, and so forth. So here we've moved up to very high frequency, which is 30 to 300 megahertz and above, which would be like UHF, um, 300 megahertz to 3 gigahertz and frequencies higher than that. So what have we got in our campy little graphic here? Uh, again, we've got the cell tower and that's to get the antennas up as high as possible so that we can get to things um, like this person in this house over here without having a bunch of trees in the way, for example. So there is a direct path from the antenna to the house. But in order to get to the person in the house who's carrying a cell phone, little, little yellow guys are cell phones, in order to get into the house, the signal has to penetrate through the sidewall of the house or the windows or the roof. 
So only a little bit of the signal gets in. Some of it may be reflected off. Meanwhile, we have this person over here, and that signal from the tower can get blocked by these trees here. This is one tree, but there could be a lot of trees in a real-world situation. And so this signal may be somewhat weak. Fortunately, however, the world involves things called multipath, where signals that take other routes, like bouncing off the ground and then getting to this cell phone, or bouncing off this house and getting to the cell phone, and again, in the real world, there are many, many different objects. And lastly, we have a user over here on the right who's probably not receiving the cell phone signal, and that's because the signal comes this way and there's a mountain in the way, and you might think the signal just goes straight out, but there is something called diffraction that can cause the signal to come down, but it's going to be a lot weaker, like 40 dB weaker, and you may lose it. Depends, of course, on how high this is and how close the person is to that peak. So, what is the upshot of all of this? Well, it's that the situation is complex, and that all of these things come together to generally make the signal weaker than it would be if we had a direct line of sight. So all of those issues combine to create a propagation path loss that has a denominator term which instead of d squared is in general something we call d to the n, where n is a number between, for example, 3 and 5. And we talked about this in some detail in episode 3. In that episode, we compared the direct line of sight in a space link from the Earth to Mars, for example, to a terrestrial situation, actually a number of terrestrial situations. One, where we have an antenna tower and then the signal gets over to a building. But also, for situations like a Wi-Fi access point that's inside a building, so indoor propagation. And what people do to deal with the complexity that we've been talking about is they take measurements. And a set of students in our courses were inside this building in a room, and you can see a floor plan of it here. It's the communications lab, and they had a receiver set up, a spectrum analyzer. Then we had some transmitters that were operating on unlicensed bands, and we carried them around to different locations in the building. So, for example, this green circle here, we sampled a number of spots along this green arc, or in that vicinity, which is a certain distance from the receiver. And we plot the signal levels that are received when we're transmitting 10 milliwatts. And we did that for a number of different frequencies. So one frequency was 151 megahertz, and we went all the way up to 2.4 gigahertz. And over here on the right are the results for the 151 megahertz case. So as we walk around the building, go out this door and go down the hallway, we want to see what the signal is here. And that's actually 30-something uh, meters away. And that's shown right here on the right-hand side. Notice there are several different points, somewhere between minus 45 and minus 30 or so dBm. Why several points? Well, we had some different antennas and we're in different locations, same distance, but different locations. And that's showing some of the complexity. The path this way is different than the path this way. There's different objects in the way. So these are healthy signal levels, no problem there. However, we also went outside. And when we went outside, there was an abrupt drop in the signal, as you can see in these data points. And then as we continued out further, the signal, of course, got weaker. And it got weaker with a path loss exponent somewhere around 4. So d to the 4th here was a good model for the measurements. And in part 2 of this episode, uh, we'll uncover why the signal dropped so much. Now, if you look into sighting of cell towers, you may run across something called Fresnel zones. I'm not going to spend any significant amount of time on that. Like so many things in engineering, there are complicated ways to look at things, and there are simple ways to look at things. The simple way is that if you've got a line of sight from the cell tower to the building, that's about as good as you can do. You're going to get some signal blocking and reflection from the building walls, etc. But you're pretty good if you've got line of sight, and that's why we put towers up high. However, a detailed analysis of this situation shows that if you have objects such as a bunch of trees or something,
that impinge not into the line of sight but get kind of close to it that they can actually cut down the signal strength. I personally don't think it's a lot of signal strength degradation, which is why I'm not really into Fresnel zones. But it's something to be studied and understood. So here's a real-world example of sighting of antennas. This is on the outskirts of the town I live in. And there is a tower, which you can see here in the foreground. And it is actually set at one of the highest points in the area. It's up on a hill. And then the tower itself gets the antennas even higher than that. And so there are a bunch of antennas up here at the top. There are a few along the way here. There is a cell tower right here, which is not quite as high. We'll come back to that. But look over here. There are a bunch of houses. Now, there are many, many more houses. There's about 50,000 people in this area. This cell tower probably doesn't serve the entire set of those people. There are other cell towers. That's the nature of cellular radio. We want to cover different areas on the same frequency from different towers. But at the top of this tall tower, there's an FM broadcast antenna array. And that needs to cover everybody because that FM station only has one tower. So we can see that there's line of sight from it to probably every house, at least on this side of these hills in the background. The people on the other side of those hills are probably going to have to rely on what's called diffraction to get the signal to them. And my guess is that's why this tower that supports the FM broadcast antenna array is so tall and why they use an array to concentrate the power towards the horizon and why they transmit seven and a half kilowatts of power. So that's an overview of the application of reflection and the related phenomenon to propagation. But before we leave this part one of today's video, let's look at antenna design. As we've said, one way to get concentration of power and therefore antenna gain, GT, to be high is to create an array, such as we see here at the top of this tower. But another way is to design the antenna with reflectors. In the middle here is a TV antenna, which looks like a log periodic, but it has some reflective elements in it. Now, I'm not going to go into this in any detail, because this is all near-field stuff. A better example is over here on the bottom left. This is actually a two-dimensional array of bow-tie kind of dipoles, so they're broad-banded by being a bow-tie shape, but they're essentially dipoles. There's one here, two, three, four. So there's a stack of four vertical, which focuses the power in the elevation direction, and then there's four over here, and so you've got two sets of those, and that focuses the power in the azimuth direction. But behind that is a screen of metal. And if the squares in that screen are sufficiently small relative to a wavelength, it will act like just a sheet of metal. But it has much less wind resistance, of course. So that's an example of a reflector that makes sure that the signals from these antennas go out to the right here and not out in the back of the antenna. So any signal that would go into the back of the antenna bounces off that reflector and comes back in this direction. And if you're designing this kind of antenna, you're going to want to know how far away the reflector should be from the antenna elements, how far back. And as we'll see in part two, we need it to be a quarter wavelength. In the bottom right, we have a dish antenna. And the way this works is there is what's called a feed antenna here that is fed with some waveguide. And signals leave that, and they hit this dish, and they reflect off it just like light does in a flashlight. And in a later video in this series, we'll talk about why this antenna has this particular shape. Essentially, it's to give it a narrow azimuth beam and a somewhat broader elevation beam. But the key element is that this surface is a reflector. And here's a few more examples of antennas that use reflectors. There is a dish antenna at the top, and this is for transmitting data across the country. 
It operates at very, very high frequencies and is very focused, so it can transmit tens or hundreds of miles, depending on how tall the tower is. It doesn't actually look like a parabolic dish antenna. However, it is, as we can see in this slide. The back of each one of these short cylinder looking things has a parabolic shape. You can see it right here and down here and so forth. And that parabola is fed with a feed antenna here. So what is this ring? What is this cylinder around it? Well, it's essentially a reflector, but its real job is to keep the signals not pointed in a particular direction, but rather block the signal from this feed from getting over to the feed inside here under this cover or the feed up here. So sometimes reflection is used to block signals. Other times it's used to focus it like a dish antenna or a parabolic antenna. And sometimes we'll use reflection to redirect signals. So for example, this is actually a horn antenna that would normally be pointing signals up, but there is a reflector here that then causes it to go 90 degrees and go out this way. All right, and lastly on this tower you can see what look like some cell phone antenna cylinders here. And if you search on YouTube you can find out what's inside those cell phone antennas. Search for teardown of Catherine 1800, 900 megahertz antenna for mobile phone a base station. So he's pulled this antenna apart and inside are actually two phased arrays. One operates at 900 megahertz, that's these larger regions here, and the other one operates at 1800 megahertz, that's these. Each is composed of a set of dipoles to cover different polarizations and they are fed by these little pieces here. And there's coax in the back, which we don't see, but we do see the backing for all of this, which is a reflector. And that's, of course, designed to send the signal in particular directions. So, for example, this one here, probably pointing over to the left, whereas this one is pointing over to the right, and they don't interfere with each other because they don't broadcast out the backside of each one. Okay, that's it for part one. I hope I've indicated why the reflection of radio waves is so important, and particularly what we can do with it. We've covered applications. Now, in part two, we are going to go into a little background and theory, as I said at the beginning, and then we'll do demonstrations. And I hope those demonstrations will inspire you to maybe take some of your own measurements at unlicensed frequencies or frequencies you're licensed for, of course. But you could do that yourself around your own house if you have tiny spectrum analyzers. I actually have two, one for a transmitter and one for a receiver and some associated dipoles. So that's coming up in part two of episode seven. Thanks for watching, and I hope this has been helpful. And I hope that you'll join us again in part two.